book friends, how's it going? Thanks for stopping by for today's video. Today's video is on the book Without You by Marley Valentine. It is my pride celebration video. I am happily taking part in a pride party in Beck's book reviews Facebook group. So hello to everyone that is watching the video from there. What a wonderful thing Bex does with this Pride celebration, and I was thrilled that she asked me to come back again this year. I want to also take a second to thank my wonderful book friend, Summer, who re recommended this book and reminded me that I had this book on my TBR, and I knew as soon as she said it, I was like, that's the book I want to read. I have not read Marley Valentine before, but this book sounded really good and deep and gritty and emotional and you know like that's me that's the kind of love story I want so I was excited to dive in I didn't really realize how heavy it was and I didn't know Marley's writing yet so wow this book starts in a really deep dark place the book is about Deacon and Julian. Deacon's brother, Rhett, who is Julian's partner, has just passed away. So sad, very sad. And I understood their grief and felt their grief and the way Marley writes it, whew, very, okay, I'm getting teary, very, very heavy. I couldn't figure out the way the book started how it was going to end up being happy and there was going to be a happily ever after. Okay, I'm going to dig in. I'm here for the journey they're on. Let's see where we go. Julian and Deacon's grief is palpable in the beginning of the book. I felt it. I myself am well versed with grief. I have talked about on my channel before that I lost my mom six years ago and then my brother passed two months after that. He took his life. It is forever changing to lose a parent and then to lose your sibling that way is very sad. And unfortunately, I've had some of the most amazing women in my life pass away the last couple of years people that molded me into who I am, I have lost. So I knew their grief. I got their grief. The interesting thing about Deacon and Julian is Deacon feels like the outsider of his family. Rhett, because of his long battle with his illness, became the focus of the family, rightfully so. And then Julian being his partner, they were kind of put on a pedestal in a lot of ways and the light was shining on them. And Deacon has a very strange relationship with his mom. He has a, a sister as well and they have a good relationship. He's got a good relationship with his dad, but like it's kind of like the thorn that pokes your side all the time. When one thing's off, it all feels off. So it is heavy for him to be home with his family during this very difficult time. I couldn't really put my finger on Deacon. I understood his grief and where he was, but trying to get a feel for like his personality and such, I, I was I it took me a while. Julian, I mean, how can you not feel for the guy, right? I liked him right away. There I have a, I had a soft spot for him right away because of the story and I was really worried that Deacon was going to be like mean to him because <laughs> Deacon is kind of rough and strong and but then as the book goes on oh I was like a pile of mush with him but he has this wall up and that's what makes him seem kind of rough and strong he does not let anyone behind that wall no one Ah, uh, I take that back. He, he lets his best friend behind that wall. Anyway, at one point, Deacon's mom asks him to go bring something to Julian at Julian's house that she's a little worried about Deacon or Julian. She wants him to go check on him. Deacon and Julian are not friends. Their common person was Rhett. 
Deacon says at one point that he feels stupid for being a little jealous of Julian um, and Rhett because why would you be jealous of that? Because that's so sad. Because of how Deacon grew up and the way that his brother's illness affected the family, he's always been on the outside. He kind of feels like the son that his mom doesn't want. And so that's, it's very hard and very tense around the family. So she asks him to go to Julian's house and he's like, oh, but he's a good son and he does. And he shows up and Julian is not in a good place. Not in a good place. Ooh, heavy. There's something about Julian being in that place that Deacon witnesses that Deacon just automatically wants to help and feels drawn to comforting Julian. They have a moment, they have a, a time. There's not a lot of words. It's just one of those moments and I felt like Marley wrote it really well. And then the book picks up a year later and you're like, wait, whoa. Ooh, okay, a year later. So it's the anniversary of Rhett's death and the parents want them all to come back and be together, go to mass, you know, be together. Julian's in this funny spot because like he's stuck and he doesn't really know where his place is. He has no family of his own. He grew up next door. He was taken under Deacon and Rhett's family's wing. And then of course their relationship between Rhett and Julian turned into something more, but he has no one now. And he doesn't really like, it's hard for him to be with Rhett's family, but yet he doesn't have anyone else. So he's like in this really stuck spot, emotionally stunted at that point, just going through the motions of life in his grief, in not being able to move forward, just bare minimum living. Deacon is the exact same way. Deacon is just living as well. He is stuck as well. Julian is that way because of what's happened and where he didn't expect this to be his life. He expected to be with Rhett forever and live their lives together. And now all of a sudden he's not there. Deacon has always been in this place and has not figured out how to get beyond it. And I thought that was interesting. I didn't know where, how, because I assumed it was gonna be them that were gonna wind up together, how that was gonna happen. They're not friends. They don't talk. They don't have like ill will towards each other, but they're both kind of angry about life. And I was like, how is this going to mesh? <laughs> and I'll be honest, I, I was about halfway through the book and there was like some things that I picked up on that I really connected with. But then I was like, where is it? Where's the love story? <laughs> and oh my gosh, it is so subtle the way Marley writes it that all of a sudden, and I'm getting teary, like it knocked me off my feet. All of a sudden, to watch these two characters grow in the quietest of ways, till all of a sudden, they're like turning towards each other and you're like, oh my God. This is from Deacon's perspective. We've kept in contact every day, our conversation's deep, our text message is funny. I can't remember the last time anybody was ever this interested in things I have to say. He listens. With an open heart and an open mind, it's impossible not to bask in that type of attention. And none of that even comes close to what it's like hearing him talk, hearing his thoughts, his ideas, what's important in his world. It also means I've been privy to how much of himself he's holding back. This I know is synonymous with Rhett, something I know he has to work out in his own time and by himself, but it's painful to witness. Julian Reed has a lot to offer this world, 
I just don't think he's figured it out yet. It's so the way she, I, I, I have tried to film this video. This is my fifth time because I'm either crying or I'm not articulating things well. I'm not explaining things well, but I'm going with it this time. This is going to be the one. <laughs> To watch Deacon feel safe with somebody on an elemental level blew me away. My heart grew like 10 sizes. He is exactly the kind of man that I like. He is a protector. He is sensitive, but he is strong. He picks and chooses his words. He's emotional. No, he allows himself to be emotional when he knows he's safe. So to watch him grow in relation to just himself being around Julian and not even realizing that it's happening until it's happening. And then Julian learning something new in discovering a friendship or whatever that him and Deacon started to have. I think the thing that took me a while to figure out is the intimacy that they have with each other. Now I can look back and recognize that, but as I was reading it, I, I hadn't absorbed that. I was in the gritty emotional pain of grief with them 100%. I was trying to figure out when and where they were going to turn towards each other because they didn't even really seem to like each other. I was trying to figure out all these big picture things that when it came down to them actually being like, whoa, what is going on between us? I was almost like speechless. I am speechless about it now. The intimacy that they figure out, that they share and have organically between them was profound to me. It's not, this is, they have intimate moments. Yes, there is some spiciness to this book for sure, but it's not about that. It's about these two souls that all of us, like that should not, could not, would not, did not even cross planes ever until all of a sudden they did even though they were running on a parallel line the whole time. Does that make sense? It wasn't all of a sudden like, oh my God, he's really cute. Or, wow, I've never liked guys before. At one point, Deacon is like, I've never been into guys. I don't really understand. Like, but it's Julian. And like, it's Julian. And this is what Julian says to him. Deacon, I've had my whole life to get used to being attracted to men. I'm not attracted to men, I say boldly. I'm only attracted to you. His confidence is like an effing aphrodisiac, like a drug injected straight into my veins, pumping blood around my body, literally bringing me back to life. He may have rendered me speechless, but every part of me is aware of him, thinks about him, dreams about him, just wants him. Does it freak you out, I hear him ask? Freak me out? No. Am I effing scared? Shitless. But I don't answer with my insecurities. I don't want to give them the time. I don't want to give them air. I don't want them. Deacon has this confidence that he just has. And Julian is attracted to that because Julian is lost in, in this moment, in this past year of life. Julian needs that confidence that Deacon has. And Deacon is willing to give it to him. He's willing to be that person for him. And on the same part of that, and it touched a little bit in there in that past, those passages where Julian sees Deacon in a way Deacon has never been seen by anybody in his life before. Deacon is attracted to that. Deacon likes basking under the rays of I'm important, I'm special, somebody wants to hear about me. He's never had that before. And he's surprised by it because on an elemental level, there is something that Julian gets 
from Deacon that he's never gotten before and that Deacon gets from Julian that he's never gotten before. They both see each other and they don't even realize it's happening until it's happening. They're kind of confused and they're like, I don't know, should we do this? And like, I kind of want to do it, but I don't know. And, but you're my boyfriend's brother. And I mean, there is that kind of cliche stuff. Of course there had to be, right? Rhett was so important to both of them. It's obvious they both recognize pain in each other and how subdued their lives are. And how all of a sudden, when they're around each other and they see things they haven't seen thing before in each other, how that lightens their loads, the loads that they've been carrying for the longest time, really, when it comes down to it. There's this moment between them. This is where the book like took off for me and I died. I was like, tears, my heart was beating. This is where it became a gorgeous, beautiful love story for me that just had my heart soaring. They're on the phone and they're having a conversation. Deacon just killed me. I totally fell for him. Like this was the hook, line, and sinker I was done for passage when it came to Deacon. It's from Julian's perspective. I imagine the vein in his forehead protruding because of the exasperation. I'm not purposely, purposely trying to be vague or appear indifferent, but there's so much to think about and so much of it has barely anything to do with the fact that I'm moving houses. It's just forcing me to take a long, hard look at the way I'm living and I can't help but be a little disappointed in the shell of a man I've become. Do I want to move this whole house, sad memories and all, into a new building and just continue to work nights in something so un uninspiring? Close your eyes, he demands. What? Why? Just trust me. And because I do trust him, I lay on the flat of my back and close my eyes. They're closed, I inform him. Now just imagine yourself somewhere, he instructs. Anywhere, really. But what would you be doing? What would your days be filled with? Your nights? What do the four walls around you look like? A lump forms in my throat as he continues to rattle off all the hypothetical scenarios he wants me to conjure up. They're simple requests, but they're poignant, as if he's listened to all my unspoken insecurities and found a way for me to embrace them. He guides me, encourages me, until the vigil he wanted me to create sits in beautiful, unfiltered focus behind my eyelids. Oh my God. Deacon, I choke out. Don't say anything, he says softly. My eyes burn with emotion as he whispers, the world is waiting for you. That's it. Oh my gosh. Can't even talk. <laughs> I absolutely loved this story. And boy, do we get happily ever after with these two. I have no idea how she did it, but boy, did Marley do it. Holy smokes. Let me know if you have read Without You or any of Marley's other books. I would love to hear. Thank you for taking a moment to consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up while you're here. I would really appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I'll see you soon. Bye.